Hello, my name is Ilaria Maselli and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a book discussion series brought to you by the Conference Board. Today, I will be sitting down with William Pezek to discuss his book, Japanization, What the World Can Learn from Japan's Lost Decades. William is a Tokyo-based journalist and former columnist for Barons and Bloomberg. The book was published in 2014, when the world was fiercely debating whether the economic policy program of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, also known as Abenomics, would succeed or not. I came across the book recently while doing some research on public debt sustainability. As a result of measures taken nearly everywhere to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world is facing a major economic contraction. According to the Conference Board estimates, global GDP growth would be minus 4.8% in 2020. To counter the shock, governments are laying down large-scale fiscal programs. The OECD estimates that public debt will increase this year from 109% of GDP to more than 137% in advanced economies. I start to receive many questions by our members on this issue, and the book is rich in insights that are incredibly timely, even though it was published six years ago. So, William, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to talk about your book. I'm sure I'm not the only one that is asking you questions about this. Well, it's great to be here, yes, but the book does ha- does seem to have had a bit of a second life uh, over the last year. I've gotten more emails and more texts and more comments and more invitations to speak about it. So it is quite interesting that it's come back around, if you will. Yeah, books have their own life. It's fantastic. Uh, Let me start from the basics. What do you mean by Japanization? Why are we talking about it now? Well, I mean, as most of your listeners will be aware of, Japan for basically about 25 years now has been walking in place. It had a very, very strong economic boom in the 1980s. The boom crashed. And Japan since then has been kind of plodding along, muddling along from basically from recession to recession. It never really quite crashed, but it's never really quite revived itself in any significant way. And Japanization is really when an economy falls into a kind of long deflationary funk that it has a difficult time getting out of, that governments have a very difficult time recovering from over time. And I think that in many ways, when you look around the world, there are a variety of countries that might be trailing Japan's same trajectory, if you will, and they're very frantically trying not to. And I think that when you look at policymakers around the world, one of the most frightening ideas for them is the idea of an economy that has fallen and can't get back up. And that is in many ways where Japan is 25 years after it first fell. That's uh, that's that's an interesting start. And I, I noted as I was reading the book a couple of more uh, things that I thought would um, help uh, defining what is Japanization. So I have something like um, low interest rate uh, trap and high debt and aging, actually. Um, I, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. But um, since you mentioned that, which countries do you actually see walking on the same li- on the same line as Japan? Well, you know, to start from biggest first, certainly the U.S. Um, The U.S. since 2008 has in many ways been stepping in the same direction Japan has by treating the symptoms of its problems, not the underlying problems. And what you've seen since the Lehman shock in 2008 is a very aggressive effort to re-stimulate the economy. The Federal Reserve went to zero. It went to quantitative easing. The U.S. government pumped a lot of money into the economy. What you haven't seen is any kind of wholesale effort to remake the economy, to increase productivity, to make sure that innovation uh, increases or accelerates. And so, again, now that you have this COVID-19 crisis, the U.S. is once again stimulating a great deal, but it's not doing enough to, in many ways, restructure the economy and to raise its economic game. So the U.S. is an obvious candidate. China also has its own uh, Japanization risks, if you will. I think that also since 2008, the government's been very focused on keeping growth as fast as possible. It's done a lot less reforming under the surface than the government in Beijing seems to 
to be claiming. Um, there are other economies like South Korea. Um, they also are quite a good candidate for Japanization. And certainly the Eurozone. Um, you know, the Eurozone is always hard to generalize about. But when you look at, say, Southern Europe, when you look at economies like uh, Italy, for example, Greece, um, these are places that could experience a Japan-like funk going forward, uh, the UK. And, you know, you can make an argument for economies like Germany over time. And in some ways, when you look at the state of the banking sector, you could also include France in this conversation. Although I do think that the US, China, and South Korea right now are the most obvious candidates. And that's a problem because these are two of the, uh, the biggest economies in the world. And you add in South Korea, you've got three of the 12 biggest economies in the world, which all could be experiencing a kind of deflation, deflationary funk uh, going forward. So basically nearly all advanced economies are at risk. And uh, I, I'm a bit surprised by the order of countries that, that you mentioned, because uh, as I was reading the book, indeed, you refer a lot and you compare a lot with the United States. But I was uh, thinking all the time about my side of the world, which is Europe. And right. precisely because you, we have a lot of things in common, this very high level uh, levels of debt in some countries and the aging problem. Um, yes. Perhaps countries like Italy and Germany are the closest in that sense to Japan. And then, of course, the fact that um, we have been trapped much more than UK and US in, uh, in the low interest rate environment since 2008 um, and a very deflationary environment. So I, 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 I would have guessed that your answer would have been uh, Europe first uh, and then all of the others. But indeed, it, this is a rather widespread risk, uh, and especially now uh, that we are entering this new economic phase. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned the most important word, which is trap, right? The liquidity trap that you've seen in Japan, the same liquidity trap the U.S. is experiencing right now, you can also apply to the Eurozone. So certainly, yeah, I mean, the Eurozone in general is at risk of a Japan-like problem, certainly. Let me move to something I uh, read in Chapter 3, where you talk about the uh, Japanese public debt as a one quadrillion yen monster, <laughs> a monster yes. that requires constant feeding and obsessive maintenance that distracts you from building a more prosperous future. So in your view, uh, is it correct to argue that the problem with the uh, high public debt is not so much its level, but the cost of servicing the debt, which takes resources away from more productive spending? Is that correct? I mean, yes, that's partially the problem. I mean, that's probably the main problem. But I think that when it comes to debt, you always have to think about the conditions around it. And, you know, debt is not issued in a vacuum. And one of the reasons why the U.S. can issue so much debt is because it, it prints the reserve currency. And one of the reasons why Japan, for example, can issue so much debt is because like 95% of Japanese debt is held domestically. So there's not a lot of risk of capital flight. But you mentioned... Demographics. One of the problems why Japan's debt, which is the largest debt, uh, you know, in terms of relative to GDP in the world, the reason why Japan's debt is so worrisome is because of the demographics. There's a, an investor in Singapore. His name is Jim Rogers. And when he is asked why he does not invest in Japan, he says he's worried about the Japanese people essentially going extinct <laughs> over time. He says, why would I buy Japanese debt? when there won't be anyone left in 20 or 30 years to pay it off. Now, that is hyperbole. He's exaggerating, of course, but he makes a valid point. If an economy is issuing lots of debt, I mean, it's just that there's a question of whether or not you have the replacement rate in the workforce, which creates incomes and creates revenues for the government to pay off that debt. And that is a problem. And Japan's demographic issues are something that we don't really talk a lot about. And the government will sometimes mention the issue of we have to figure out a way to stimulate the birth rate to get young couples to have babies. Uh, we have to figure out a way to import more labor, but it's not something they take very seriously over time. And when you look at the demographics of, say, Europe, uh, Europe, as you mentioned, is moving also in a similar direction of basically neg almost negative demographic growth. And China, you could argue, also has a similar problem at the moment. Their population growth is slowing rapidly. And so, you know, debt, the servicing costs and the demographics put together, it does create a bit of a ticking time bomb for some of these countries. And I guess, you know, one of the things you hear about when you, when you read, say, communiques from G20 meetings or G7 meetings, 
is we must increase economic growth. We must hasten economic growth to pay off this debt. But that is a very, very difficult thing to do at the moment when you're talking about a global recession, a global downturn, and a pandemic, which makes it very difficult for governments uh, using conventional means like cutting interest rates, like issuing more debt to stabilize the economy. So there are no experts at the moment. We're in one of those, those situations where we've never been before as a globalized economy. And where anybody will be six months from now or one year from now debt-wise is a very big mystery. Indeed, indeed. Um, but if I think of Japan, then yeah, you actually um, talk about this in the book in the about all these contradictions. So you have all of these economic problems. And at the same time, um, Japan has top-notch infrastructures, uh, low levels of crime, high living standards. So I have a really hard time reconciling the, the doom of the monster you mentioned and the fact that it's at the end of the day a very prosperous society. How do you square that? I mean, you're right. It is a very good question. It's something that after more than 15 years in Japan, I've been trying to reconcile myself. Japan, in many ways, I always think of it as a tale of two economies in that when you look at the numbers themselves, when you look at the deflation, when you look at almost zero growth, it is an economy in trouble. But when you look around this place, you're right. I mean, there's not a lot of crime. There's a certain level of efficiency to the place. And even when Japan does have a crisis, when it had a banking crisis back in the 1990s, the place never unraveled. You never quite had mass, massive unemployment. You don't really have much in the way of homelessness here. And I guess, you know, J Japanese style socialism, if you will, works in many ways. But if you're an investor, if you're a company looking to Japan as a place to make money, that can be a very different prospect because productivity here is low. Um, Japan is not known to be terribly open to foreign investment and foreign companies headquartering here doing things their own way. And there's a lot of inefficiencies and rigidities in the system. And so I always think of Japan as this kind of tale of two economies and you know, which one will prevail in the next, say, 10 to 20 years is really anyone's guess. But I think that one of the things that worries me is that this tale of two economies was really fine until China showed up. I think the real change factor, the real catalyst for concern about Japan right now is the fact that before China became a major player in the region, Japan could do its own thing. But now Japan, China is forcing this level of competition from the outside. It's forcing this kind of competition for capital, for, you know, for labor, for innovation. And that in many ways has been a wake up call for Japan. And I'm not sure the government here, which can be very slow moving, has really figured out a way to compete with China because Japan has two choices, really. Japan has become a very expensive, neighbor, uh, very expensive property in a somewhat cheap neighborhood. Japan's decision is whether or not to allow living standards to adjust lower towards China or find out a way to innovate its way to higher you know, niche areas and become more productive so that it can maintain its living standards and excel from there. And again, I'm not quite sure Japan has found a way to do that. So I've really got my popcorn out to see <laughs> where things go in the next 5, 10, 20 years. That might take a long time, but in the meantime, we're going to take a short break so for some quick announcements and be back in just a minute um, to continue this fascinating conversation with William Pesek on the book Japanization. Looking for additional business insights in this subject area and beyond this podcast? Go to tcb.org and explore our Human Capital Centre. Uncover a large array of products hosted by the Conference Board in focus areas like diversity and inclusion, talent management and many others. Products include peer-to-peer -peer networking events, expert briefings, publications, data and analysis, webcasts, videos and blogs. Hello and welcome back to our conversation with William Pesek on the book Japanization. There is a lot of discussion on inflation in these days. Some inflation could actually help governments in the next years to make the debt burden lighter, but that seems unlikely. 
Our view at the conference board is that the crisis is mostly deflationary, the current crisis, that we might see pockets of inflation for some specific goods and services, but all in all, the deflationary forces are much stronger with low energy prices, no pressure on wages with high unemployment, weak demand, downbeat expectations. William, uh, what is the world like in a deflationary environment? Because you've been living in Tokyo, you said, for more than 15 years uh, now. So tell us, what is the, the world like without, deflation, without inflation? Well, you know, there's a kind of a half glass full view of deflation in Japan. And what I mean is that, you know, when you, you read the, the economics textbooks that we all learned, we all, we all read back in college, when you think about economists like Milton Friedman, They talked about deflation as being this terribly evil force and a very alarming force like the, uh, the, the alarm going on right now. But they, um, they talked about deflation as being this great, incredible evil. Japan has found a way to keep deflation as a, a somewhat of a more benign force. And what I mean is that for, I think for many Japanese, they've adjusted to it. They've learned to live with it. And for many Japanese, they almost view deflation as a kind of stealth tax cut, if you will. Now, that's the half glass full argument. The half glass empty argument is that I agree with you. I think that the disinflation that we're seeing around the globe is here to stay. It's not cyclical for me. It's, sec it's secular. When you look at the, the collapse in oil prices, when you look at trends in gold prices, There's not a lot of indications that there is much inflation out there. And the reason why you do want to have a little inflation is because it suggests a level of confidence. It suggests the system is working. It suggests that the animal spirits are intact. But I think that in many ways, when you look at the state of the world, disinflation is the much more likely scenario and outright deflation in certain economies. When I read about economists worried about uh, inflation in the U.S., I roll my eyes a bit. I don't see where the upward price pressures are going to come from. And I think that the more likely scenario is that as disinflationary pressures or deflationary pressures spread, you're going to see a lot of conflict economically around the world. You're going to see more desperate kind of uh, mercantilism, if you will, between large economies, especially from the US in the Trump era. Uh, you're going to see more of a beggar thy neighbor dynamic, if you will between economies looking for any kind of competitive advantage they can find. You'll see currencies uh, devalued here and there. You'll see central banks under more pressure to, to cut interest rates. But I think that one reason why deflation is likely is because, again, what, what I said at the top of this interview is we're treating the symptoms of the problem, not the underlying causes. And central bank easing is fine, but central bank easing just bit, pumps more money into the system If there's no uses for the money, there's no confidence in taking that money and investing it and spending it and fattening paychecks, then it doesn't do much good. So I'm with the conference board. I think that unfortunately, disinflation or deflation is going to be with us for a while here. Now, of course, the paradox of Japan is that inflation never appeared despite the ultra low interest rates and all the attempts done to, to uh, pump the economy. And uh, there is actually a funny quote um, in chapter one. I mean, the quote is actually not funny in itself, but reading it now, it's funny. Uh, so you basically uh, recall that Christine Lagarde um, asks in 2013, when she was the head of the IMF, what would happen if central, bank, central banks raised interest rates again? Now, we know, uh, exposed that shortly after uh, the Fed and the Bank of England, did, did the Bank of England did start increasing interest rates again, while actually the ECB never managed to do so. So now we're, we're in a place where not even a decade later, um, we have the perspective again of another decade of ultra low interest rates. And um, you argue in the book that the ultra low interest rates did more damage than good to the economy. So can you explain to us in which way? Well, I think the problem, I really do think of it as one of addiction. I think that central banks have cut rates to a certain level for so long that we've all gotten addicted. I mean, here in Japan, for example, when rates went to zero, uh, people got used to it. Businesses got used to it. Uh, banks got used to it. Insurance companies got used to it. Pension funds got used to it. Investors got used to it. Um, and also households got used to it. So when the government did try about five years after the fact, to raise interest rates once or twice, 
there was a lot of anger about it. There was a lot of disruption in the financial system. And over time, Japan had to reverse course and cut rates back to zero. You've seen the same thing in the U.S. since then. Um, you know, in the years after the Lehman shock, the Fed cut rates to zero. And then the Janet Yellen Fed began raising interest rates. And then early on in the Powell Fed era, they began, they kept on raising interest rates. And now we're back to zero and beyond. And I think the problem is that when you cut rates to zero, we get addicted to it. And it also deadens animal spirits. It basically gives the business culture, it gives the political culture fewer incentives to do the hard work of making economies more competitive because it's just too easy when the central bank is pumping all this money into the economy. And I think when when you look at QE, a QE was supposed to be sort of life support. You know, basically, if you think of an economy in, in the hospital, QE was all about keeping the economy alive, shocking the system and, and nursing it back to health. But what's happened is QE's become a permanent feature of the world that we've lived in over the last, say, certainly globally over the last 12 years. And so people have gotten a bit, you know, again, addicted. Here we are. That's that's very interesting what you're saying, especially in view of, you know, where we are now um, and uh, uh, what decisions central banks are taking now. This becomes actually extremely relevant. Now, um, the COVID-19 outbreak will leave scars on the economy and the society, unfortunately. I think it's safe to anticipate that. Yet, I don't want to conclude this conversation with a bitter taste. So uh, here is my, my next question. Um, do you think there is a way for countries to escape this sort of trap that you described of um, low inflation, low interest rates, addiction to QE, um, despite the aging and debt uh, that's, that we see right now? I think the answer is yes, but only if we work together. What is missing is cooperation. It still is amazing that we are not having, you know, weekly or even daily Zoom calls between <laughs> finance ministers around the world, G7 officials, G20 officials. We need more coordination. Uh, we need more coordination between central banks. It's no longer the case that one central bank, say in Korea or Brazil or in the UK, cutting interest rates matters much. You have to do it in concert. You have to do it in coordinated fashion. You've got to make it big and bold. And I think the same thing goes for fiscal policy. I think when you look at the ways in which all these governments are acting independently from one another to stimulate economies, that's fine. But nothing would have greater would get more would get greater traction than all of these economies getting together and putting out a plan and essentially coming up with a sort of schedule, if you will, of fiscal and monetary policy moves to just basically say, we are the world, we're working together, we're in this together, and we need to make sure that we give these stimulus actions as much traction as possible. And when you have all these different countries working for the same goal, but doing so independently, it doesn't, it doesn't really do much, do much good. And the other thing that I think we need to do is while there is this cooperation, there needs to be a moratorium on new tariffs, on new capital controls. I, you know, I think one of the, we can probably do another podcast on all of the failings of the Trump administration during this crisis. But one of the, the dumbest things the Trump administration has done is kept its China tariffs in place. What, what they should have done immediately was said, look, the world is hurting right now. We're talking about the two biggest economies in the world we in the U.S., we're going to put a moratorium on our levies and our taxes on Chinese goods for now. Trump refuses to do that, and he's still threatening more. So I think you need to see that. But I do worry that in the Trump era, um, until the U.S. election come November, the idea of global cooperation will be a very difficult one. So I think that other members of the G7, perhaps Chancellor Merkel, will have to be the one to step forward and say, we need to cooperate more. The U.S. should cooperate with us. And we welcome the U.S. coming to the table and working hand in hand with us, in some ways shaming the U.S. into working with the rest of the world. Maybe, maybe I'm being too optimistic and naive about that, but I think that that's necessary. That's the only way that the global economy 12 months from now can be any better off than it is at the moment, I believe. <laughs> 
I think that's a very safe and simple and effective recommendation. And indeed, what I remember from the um, after uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, there was actually more cooperation at uh, G7 level than what we have seen yes. right now. So, I mean, it is possible to do it. And we have a recent memory uh, of that. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. I was reading your book last week, but what are you reading <laughs> right now? Well, actually, right now I'm reading a book by Eric Larson. Um, one of my favorite writers. It's called The Splendid and the Vile. Um, it's, again, by Eric Larson. It's a nonfiction book about the 1940s and about, until about 1940 to 1941 about how Winston Churchill led the British people through the London Blitz. And it's a very, very interesting read about history, certainly, but about the, the kind of the, the strong will of one leader and how he inspired an entire nation to stomach some very, very dark times. And you know, one of the reasons why I find this book so interesting right now is because the, the parallels to where we are today are not perfect. But there are a lot of moments where you find yourself thinking, who is Winston Churchill today? Who is that leader around the world who can kind of summon the courage and has the charisma to say to other leaders, let's, uh, let's get on the phone. Let's talk about this. And in the more the more modern context, I guess we'd say, let's do a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, William, and thank you all for joining for joining this podcast. I highly recommend the book. Uh, not only it's rich in insights, but it's actually a very pleasant read. And we only spoke about the more economic part of it, but it's actually a broader description of the Japanization, and there is a, actually a very interesting chapter on uh, um, on uh, gender gender balance in Japan. Uh, yeah. Remember to subscribe to our Off the Shelf channel to hear more book discussions. And if you'd like to hear more on economics-related topic, we also invite you to subscribe to the Conference Board Indications podcast that you can find on your favorite podcast platform as well as on tcb.org slash podcast. I'm Ilaria Maselli from the Conference Board and thank you all for joining us. 